Okay, so um, that was a very long five minutes. We were just finishing up some technology. But I'd like to ask the facilitator for each table to please come up here, and we're going to ask you to do a very quick sort of 60-second summary of what your table discussed. I, I would recommend that you bring your sheets of paper with you because this is just on a loop up here, so you won't refer to that. And um, come on up. Thank you. So come on down, first facilitator. Hello, everyone. It's funny, it's so, a room full of architects, but nobody drew. Oh, well, no, so. Okay. Hi. So at my table, we started off with a story. Uh, one of our members shared that he recognized riding the bus and that he could anticipate when people of different races were going to get on or off. And so from that, we recognized there was acknowledgement of, sp of spatial segregation. So that led us to an assessment. So trying to interpret, well, why did this happen? Was it um, intentional? Is that what the people had planned when they made these neighborhoods? Or was it something that came about um, over time? Or perhaps was it planned, unfortunately, but what we're looking at now is the residual effect of that. And so we're looking at cities, spaces, um, built environments that are dealing with the inheritance of past issues. And with uh, that residual, impact um, that shapes how we look uh, at future developments. And so from there, we looked at the relationship between ourselves and others. And so trying to figure out what appropriate intervention would be. And that would require us to have the courage to initiate, to join, invite others in, and to listen in order to engage. And another thing that came out in our group as a potential problem or something to overcome is the idea of perception. Um, so for us, and perhaps very many of you here in the room as well, we want to be involved, we want to help be a part of the solution, but we feel that there's also a, the idea of a, a persecution or perhaps a pigeonholing or lack of respect for quote unquote social justice warriors. Um, and at, the, at our table, we talked about the idea like that I, that sounds like a wonderful thing, Let's sign me up for that, but somehow <laughs> in our common um, culture that has somehow become derogatory. So looking at ways that we can dare to endeavor anyway, despite this uh, perhaps negative um, interpretation of getting out there to do these things. Thank you. So I'm, I'm sorry to say I'm going to be a little more strict with time. That was beautiful. Um, <laughs> but what we want to do is, is go through this long list of wonderful people with all of your thoughts. And then we'll also open it up to just more general questions from the mic to the panelists. So next, please. Thank you, Joyce. So we had a very robust conversation that started with the notion of justice. How do we define justice? We can define often injustice. We know the specifics of that. But do we understand how to create justice? And going from there, that brought us to the role of planners and designers today. Um, where are we today? I know in urban planning, we spend a lot of time on history and equity planning in the 1960s, but how does that translate to 2015? In that regard, we began to think of the GSD curricula. Where are the architecture students? Could you raise your hands? How many of you are architecture students? Architecture was kind of spotlighted in our discussion because the students don't often get economics, they don't learn about policy and implementation and history, and you know, what is the function? Is shape more important than everything else in architecture? That's what we wrote on our notes. So we began to think, how can we engage um, social equity in both the architecture and urban planning curriculum more? Thank you. Hi, yeah, I had a wonderful conversation with, uh, with people at my group and my table, and I think we kind of began with the importance of changing the narrative, making the narrative more positive, and that led us to how shall we change the space of these conversations? How do we invite more people into these conversations, people 
uh, from communities perhaps going into communities. Another thing that we were considering is how do we, those people who do have power, as we were describing, whether it be getting funding or being able to get things built or being able to shape the policy, how do we reflect on their own personal reflections and then how does that, um, how are we able to give that power to other people or spread that power and resources around? Thanks. Hi. At our table, we ended up talking a lot about uh, the role of designers and planners, but more specifically, the power that they have and their power as it relates to community empowerment, understanding the power of relationships, not just between the larger stakeholders and organizations, but also between community members, fostering more integration among them. Also, uh, looking generally at relationship building, but also a little bit more fine-grained on community investment, ensuring that people would be able to stay in their community, that they're not moving to opportunity someplace else and then you know leaving their uh, old neighborhood behind and also looking at uh, sorry looking at my notes um, looking at uh, integration across the regions and not just thinking about uh, the city the main downtown as a lot of people have been focused on lately but also looking at what's happening now in the suburbs and also just really focusing on the power of persuasion that we all have as designers and planners and the role that we can play in changing the perception and also just stimulating the conversation hello a man out table looked at opportunities for the GSD. The opportunity to reduce isolation amongst us, which can be pervasive in these days where everyone is looking at their screen. Uh, the opportunity to promote value, the value of architecture with more accessible communication. To look at solutions beyond space, how social factors can interact with space towards justice. To use the power of design communication to help people see and visualize options. And use the power of G the GSD as an institution to change from the ground up what we teach, who we are, the students and the faculty. Hi everyone, um, my table also looked very similarly at the GSD and our experiences here. Um, one of the things we really talked about was being able to recognize our own privilege, not our privilege, just white privilege, black privilege, whatever type of privilege, but also looking at our privilege as Harvard students and of faculty and administrators, um, and what does that mean? We also looked a little bit further at the curriculum here and talking about what, what parts of the, the school are talking about issues of social justice and equity, uh, and the conclusion was just the urban planners. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of criticism of the architects not really caring, um, and I think it's maybe a little evident of how few of us are here right now. Um, I think a lot of it was also talking about uh, the vernacular of the uh, pedagogy in itself, um, in which we have to make sure that we are not just sitting in these molds of that we're like uh, the Bauhaus or modernism, that we can actually expand beyond them and really incorporate novel ideas of community engagement and being a little bit more uh, boots on the ground. Thank you. Okay, what we can do uh, moving forward, we can have a new lead, which is leadership for excellency and equity design, and we can figure out a toolkit and a process that entails both uh, looking back at so that it, we demystify for folks uh, and create understanding about how we came to the spatial segregation, to the devaluation of properties, to the bad kinds of zoning, et cetera, so that that helps to lift the trauma that people living in these bad spaces that have historically been created uh, feel that they're oppressive spaces. So we have a mirror looking back. One of our images was a mirror. A mirror looking back and also a mirror that uh, exposes white privilege. That was another comment that often white privilege is not seen. And so uh, one of the roles that designers have is to expose that. And then another image was the clock, that we need more time. Right? How do we get these things? This is where we have to leverage power in the process. And that means that what Kimberly did, wearing multiple hats and getting involved in the process earlier on with the funding and the legal aspects can give us that power.
Uh, my group similarly, look at, similarly looked at uh, where the designer fits in in terms of that whole process. So we started out with this pretty prov provocative question about um, where is justice implicated along the range of process, uh, intangible process to kind of your tangible form at the, um, as the end product. Um, so in terms of thinking about the designer skill set, what does uh, the designer bring, whether it's expertise or is it the, uh, the facilitation and communication skills, the representation skills, whether you know, it's plan view, um, inter uh, plan view community or sorry, plan view activities, is that actually empowering uh, the community members you're trying to engage with or are there other forms of representation that are more just, I guess. Um, and then finally, um, there's another interesting point about um, is our role as designers to just offer more choice? Are the um, community members now, are they merely consumers of, our, of the options we provide? Um, so some of the questions that like, kind of stuck with me that we were tossing around um, and ultimately um, trying to get down more what is this justice we're looking for and how do we know it? Yeah, thank you. Hi. Uh, uh, our group talked about the role of designers in building more equitable and beloved communities. So we started by talking about the misalignment between these systemic problems and what our projects can actually achieve uh, and how we can uh, use the tools of design to have a more robust conversation. Uh, but then we talked a lot about the constraints of that, that uh, uh, some places are planned to death, some people uh, feel like that the design process is exclusive in itself. Uh, NIMBYism is a, a constant pervasive problem in, in our conversations about equity and affordable housing. And, and that we just aren't leveraging our capacity as designers to really uh, quantify and sell the benefits of building uh, more inclusive communities. Uh, but then we also talked a lot about some of the, the real possibilities um, and, and, and some of them are uh, linking sustainability and resilience to uh, what we really need in communities, which is a sustained engagement with, uh, with communities to, uh, to solve these problems. It's more of like... We also spend most of our time talking about the role of the designer. Um, and uh, it felt like uh, people at our table thought the architect has an unusual responsibility, designer, planner, the capacity to empower people. Because so many people in neighborhoods uh, that are disenfranchised have no sense of control. And decisions about what their place will look like have all been made by other people. And the architect's ability to say, no, you can shape this, uh, is an important kind of empowering for people. Um, uh, we talked about varieties of knowledge that in every community you go into, you're a planner or an architect with knowledge. There are things you know that you can help people do. And the role of the architect in valuing the knowledge which is held by the community, which you don't have because you don't live there. And so that, again, that balancing saying, yeah, that's as important as what I know for designing what we have to design here. Um, we asked the question of whether there's anything that designers should not do if you have a concern about equity in the world. In this age of mass incarceration, should any architect agree to design jails? And we asked the question about, what, about the role of race. Michael has asked us to, to foreground race. So can a white architect or planner work in an African-American neighborhood? Is there any way for that to work constructively? People at our table said it's a matter of authenticity, it's a matter of humility, it's a matter of listening, and finally it's a matter of, of valuing everything you hear around you and being able to contribute at that point. What he said. <laughs> That's the man. I had a good group of revolutionaries, too, in my table, and I didn't pay him to say this. Outreach and engagement process is broke. That's what they, we began with. And we talked about the design process and how, like Jim was saying, that there shouldn't be a difference between community architecture and architecture. It should just be architecture. And that's where we should begin with every process when we start planning our cities from there. And I think the big thing that I'll add, I'm not sure if my group completely agreed, but <laughs> that there needs to be a big block that we stand on, that urban planners, designers, landscape architects, architects can all stand on at the same time and say, this is a project we can support together, and these are the ones we need to walk away from, the jails, the bad housing projects, the inappropriate commercial developments, 
and as a unifying group say, we're not doing that anymore. Hi, um, my group uh, began talking about privilege. Um, unfortunately, the person that um, brought up the topic had to leave, so we couldn't have the, it was, uh, um, she was really, really frustrated um, because of uh, a comment that was made by Michael Hayes about uh, uh, white um, people not understanding um, white privilege, and um, she was very frustrated that uh, that, that was brought up, um, and so I think, um, it was unfortunate that she left because we um, weren't able to have a conversation with her about how, why she felt that way. Um, but then we also, after she left, we also had a discussion of how, how can we um, meet people at where they are and start having those conversations even the, uh, if they're uncomfortable. Um, and um, I think we had a very um, good discussion around that. Um, we also talked about uh, the dis a designer as an educator and um, an educator of um, their own communities, but also um, educators of um, um, kind of politicians for them to understand how exactly the built environment um, can and um, is influencing um, the kind of social inequities within a city and how um, they can use it to um, kind of build progress. Um, and so that's where we um, stopped talking. Then. Thank you. Um, we talked a lot about uh, curriculum and pedagogy and talked about how um, students and other programs interact with each other and how to foster more of that. Uh, we talked about the production of safe space, empathetic frameworks. Uh, we talked about environmental justice and social inequity and how that, I think, relates to the school is um, one question came up, are we um, designing for idealized communities? Um, when we're practicing uh, sort of in, in academics. Uh, and then I think one of the questions that came up was, uh, or one of the sort of comments was, every studio brief represents a choice, as do, does the selection of critics. Um, so to think through some of those, those things as we go about our, uh, our day. Let's give a round of applause to our great facilitators. And um, I also want to say that I really appreciate you bringing up the, 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 you know, the anecdote about the person who walked out. This was kind of a brave and maybe not an incredibly smart endeavor to do so quickly. We could actually spend an entire weekend having a common language around all of these words, prejudice and racism and bias and what all of the, and privilege and what it all means. And so please, um, Forgive us for not doing that yet, but perhaps that could be a next step to consider here because obviously it's important. We need everyone at the table. And to that end, I just want to thank all of you for staying and for leaning in so hard. I'm incredibly heartened and thrilled by the turnout and the participation tonight. So kudos all of you. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Michael, and we, I think we're going to ask for some you know, questions from the audience and also have a wrap-up from the panelists. So I think we'll end soon. Um, maybe we could have, I think in some ways the, the facilitators, I hope, we're, we're, we're giving voice to, to, to other people to, to what, what went on at the tables, but maybe we can take four or five questions at the mic to the panelists and then let the panelists respond to the, to the entire group of questions. Let's take four questions first and then the panelists res uh, respond to those questions uh, in conclusion. So anyone, yes, you come up please and there are a couple of others. We can go ahead and like line up since we're, oh, go um, ahead. So quickly, um, as people that have been involved in design um, and, and designing um, space in your work, who do you find as the most strategic partner? Anyone? This? Sure. Um, I, I, I think a lot of it is contextual. It kind of depends on what the project is seeking to address. So say if I'm dealing with a project around health equity, then one of the most strategic partners is somebody who's expert in public health. So it, it kind of depends on what the project's going to address. But then bar none, the community. 
I think a lot of times we think of them as like, well, we're doing that for them, right? Not with them. But for me, they should be at the table equal with, because they are experts as well. They know more about what it's like to live and work in that community than I ever will. And, but rarely have they been empowered to think of that as expertise. So that's always an essential thing. And then the other stuff comes out of the context of the project. I, I would just also add the, um, the client or the person who writes the check, um, because, you know, things probably wouldn't get built without them. So I would just, you know, I would sort of obviously echo what, what Liz just said, but also, um, you know, help illustrate why what you're doing is important and really sort of show, why, you know, why it's valuable so that they'll write that much more of a check for, <laughs> for your ideas. And I would just say, in addition to the partnerships, it's also important to be strategic about your audience, so who you're actually targeting. So um, it, it's great to have alliances and allies with like-minded people, but could it sometimes have higher impact if you're you know, creating a forum for policymakers and community residents to directly engage as well? And I'll just conclude by saying, don't forget about yourself as an important partner in this and making sure that, that the work you're doing really feeds into your own values. The last thing you want to do is to be working on something that you hate every minute of the day. Uh, now, I can guarantee that each one of you is going to have that experience. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, make sure that you're able to live out your own values. Mark, is that you? Yeah, that's me. Um, this is a question for Kimberly, but maybe for the whole panel, which is you went to architecture school, you practiced. Now you're at the Kennedy School because you want to learn about public policy and finance and real estate. Do you imagine an idealized architecture school that does that? Or is it better to um, sort of sort of find our voice in a profession and then branch out and then focus on those other schools? Uh, that's a really good question. I'm not sure yet, but I, if I have to, since I have to answer right now, um, I, th I mean, I'm okay with my path. Like I thought, um, you know, having like the five year undergraduate experience was great. Um, I also took advantage of the other resources at Cornell because there are like seven, or there are to a total of seven schools where you can study lots of different things. So I took planning classes, I took business classes. I, you know, I did a, a wide variety of things even then. And then I sort of parlayed that into um, my work experience over the last like eight or nine years. And then I think because um, you know, all those experiences led me to like even more questions. I was like, oh, I think I should go back to school now to try to figure it out. Um, but I mean, there's also some value in um, you know academia really sh you know being more intentional about letting students know, hey, you actually have a really wide variety of options, so you can um, you know be more diverse in your class selection. And um, you know, I think to the extent that students are exposed to a wider array of opportunities. Um, you know, and you know, as an undergraduate, I think that um, will inform their decision making even more. Others want yeah, next one. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um, so, for I guess some thoughts, and I hope it comes to a question for the <laughs> architects from California. Um, so I've just Liz and Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, it's it's really fun to be in this room where you get to be, where we kind of get to be on our urban planning moral high horse, where we are responding to community and diverse groups and architects don't or any of that. And then it's kind of, it's kind of a way of, it's a kind of a way of saying, how do we even empower architects to come to this conversation if we're saying, hey, when you show up, you're gonna be attacked immediately. It's the same as bringing white people to a conversation about diversity. It's saying, oh, when you show up, you're gonna be attacked. So it's kind of how do we actually empower these people who are our colleagues to say you, your voice is valid, that you aren't heard very much here, um, and you actually really need to be included in this. So for you, the MRCs who um, are uh, teaching other students or involved in any of that process, um, sorry, say to, to everyone, how, how do you involve architects um, who may not think they immediately have a role in that because I, there's so many parallels between inviting architects to this conversation and inviting white people to a diversity conversation or inviting the white architect. Um, <laughs> that is kind of how do, in a way it's kind of how do you empower these people to talk about this when they think they're only gonna be attacked or that they're only a voice of privilege. Um, 
any of that. Okay. Anyone? Uh, well, I, I think some of that needs, um, or can you reframe it as, how does this become valuable in an architecture conversation? Like, how do we make it important, right? So instead of like, how do we empower, um, because I don't think architects need to be empowered, but I think the validating mechanisms of what defines good work needs to be rehashed, right? So right now, who's winning awards? Like, whose projects are getting published? And I think these like external validating mechanisms also need to be reformed to have different platforms. I also think that it's, um, it's a combination of stuff. I think one, it's creating a safe space like that everybody's kind of open to both being critiqued, but we're critiquing ourselves. I mean, Teresa mm -hmm. and I are both participating in this article series about design for equity, and we've been commenting that one of the things, and it's been a super critical series, and one of the things that we've done is we critique ourselves first. Like, we're not out there naming names, we critique our own failings, and use that as an example of to how to talk about, like, rethinking this work. So I think, bar none, that's one. I think the other thing is offering opportunities for true cross-disciplinary work. Like one of the things I do in my courses is I hijack it. So like, I don't care which department's giving me the line, but I try and make sure that I have a spread across all disciplines. And I actually make them work in teams with somebody who is not in their discipline. And sort of force them to recognize like, what are the skills that that person's bringing to the table? And it's really interesting because they'll sort of talk about like, well, the planner thinks about it in this way, but actually architecture, thinks about it in this way, and what they realize at the end of the day is that they both have things to contribute to the whole thing. And then I, I end up talking a lot to audiences of professional architects, and one of the things I say to them is like, when you saw the economic crisis, and it was like a third of the profession got laid off, it was because building was a luxury. The, I was never in danger of being unemployed, even though I was doing architecture, but I was doing architecture around social impact work. And so that's where the foundations and other clients, like now in this crisis, we have a need around housing, we have a need Need around health stuff and that actually created more work for me and so part of it is for our profession to be sustainable we have to start to branch out and bridge these things which I think is starting to come to the table in a professional circle and I think it just needs to come back down to academia that that is also happening one last question hi okay so I'm one of the few MRGs in the room and I'm really so <laughs> sad to see All right. All right. so few of us here um, but Kind of going off of the last question and the incident with the person that had to leave the room, I have a question because normally when we have these conversations, um, there is a kind of burden, right, on the person of color to kind of be the educator, to be the informer. Um, and I think, I guess I'll just be quick and short. How have you dealt with this in school mm. with kind of socially unconscious critics, like they just say that, and um, <laughs> just, how, as designers and architects of color, like how, how have you grappled with this in school and as part of your work? Like, do you take that on? Like, I just don't know. How can we feel more empowered without having to kind of need, you know, educate others? Honestly, do you even be able to join us in our conversation? We already have to do so much more. So, um, yeah, that's just it. <laughs> oh, that's a complicated one. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess I, um, I have a, um, a mentor uh, who's like 65, black woman, does stuff around social impact. And she said to me, on one hand, you have to accept that you have this burden. Like, I would love to be able to tell you you don't, but you do. And like, by you being in this space, you're paving the road for other people to come in after you. And so I think to a certain degree, I sort of accept that that, that is what I have to do, but I take it on this idea of instead of me preaching to you about like this is what I've gone through, how do I use that to create a conversation where we can both talk about what it's like? Because I'm sure there's also things from your end that you feel. You may feel the burden of the fact that you are not a person of color, right? And like how do we actually talk about that? Uh, and I think that I also try and make sure that all the work that I do is based in like some serious rigor. 
and high design talent. Like I'm constantly submitting for awards and other things because I want it to be not that this is a social project, I want it to be that this is a good project mm -hmm. and a beautiful project. And I think that's one of the things that we need to do to push this out of that realm of the feel good stuff. Like it actually is really good. It can create really great outcomes that actually are what we want to get to. And I think that's related to the earlier comment about like how do you push this to the next level? It's being like, it's just as rigorous as everything else. So, you know, you can't critique about the social element of it because you have to value the other things that it's bringing. Yeah, I think that's dead on. I think, you know, honestly, my, my time at the GSU was really hard. You know, it's four long years of just, like, fighting against, like, this is what I, my heart believes, and then push back of, like, well, why is that important? There are all these other things that you also need to demonstrate. And I think one of the most valuable things, and actually... The time at the GSU was so important because I wouldn't be where I am without it. Um, was it forced, because it was a different voice, it forced me to really articulate it, but in this, using the same tools, using the same jargon. So being able to like be as rigorous, mm -hmm. um, as theoretically driven and high quality, and then once you put that out there, I mean, there's really no other way to, um, how do you invalidate something like that? Yeah, I think the best part for me was my, Michael sat on my thesis review, which was uh, looking at apartheid spaces in South Africa, and I didn't, I, I'm an MRC, but I did not produce a building, um, which was already a big thing. And, um, but I had like 10 or 15 boards, the majority of which were actually breaking down the issues and the theory across sociology and economics before I got to the design. And Michael said, this is one of the best thought out theses that I've seen in a really long time. And for me, that was hugely validating because I was taking a risk dealing with something that was all about race and space. And I was fully prepared for the jury to just slay me. And it was actually one of the best reviews I've ever had here at the GSD. Azura, you're going to have the last one. One, one last yeah, question. No, no, I'm so have, sorry. You, you said four it. or five, so I was just waiting till the space cleared. Um, yeah, and this is maybe a slightly more personal question. I guess I wanted to bring it back to that image. I mean, part of why we're here tonight is because this year, you know, because of what happened in Ferguson and Staten Island and Charleston and Cleveland, I mean, it's been an unusual year, not in that, you know, black men were being killed regularly, but just by how public and how brazen it was. Right. And I think at the GSC, we've all sort of been struggling with how, like, so how do we, how do we react, you know, how do we react? as designers, um, as people, as citizens. So I'm just wondering if anyone wants to answer, like how have you maybe processed um, what's happened this year and how, how if, if and how it's informing your practice or like how you see your role as a designer? You know, I, uh, uh, kind of what you all described, I'm even gonna go back to that last question as well too and kind of tie these in together. Um, I mean, listening to Liz and Teresa, what they're describing is what a lot of folks call the black tax. It's this ex it is that burden. And I carry that with me almost on every project, for good or for bad. Uh, I was told when I was young, even, uh, as part of the tools to combat racism, that you're going to have to be better than the other folks around you. And so I put myself and, and was put on this path towards excellence in, in all that I do. And I realized and recognized that many times, I, I was the, for the city of Minneapolis, I was the first artist in residence uh, and worked in transit. And I, and I had a cubicle. It was the first time in my life I had a cubicle, working right in the city. Uh, and I knew that if I messed up, that there was never going to be not only another artist in residence, but there definitely wouldn't be another black, bald artist in residence. <laughs> and, but that's part of that burden and part of that black tax that you take with you, that, that I carry with me. Now, in uh, also in answer to the question uh, about always teaching, uh, that is, that's part of that burden too. Now there are some things that I now, in my 60s, have resigned myself to and actually resigned from doing. Uh, I 
know and have recognized, and here I am teaching, <laughs> I know and have recognized that racism isn't really my problem. It affects me and affects me badly. And I, part of my black tax is also walking out in the street as a bald black man and, and knowing, and you know, I could tell you story after story after story of being stopped by the police. Uh, and wherever I am. I mean, so that's part of that burden as well, too. But I recognize that racism isn't my problem. I mean, there are black folks who discriminate, but in terms of structural racism, there's no way that we can practice it the way that this power system that we're in and this power dynamic that we're in uh, uh, can, can work on any way that the burden that I place on folks, and I place this on, on white people. Uh, and in fact, it's too bad that the woman got up and left because this is something that we're all going to have to do, but to be really introspective and look at ourselves uh, is kind of the first step in asking ourselves the question, you know, how do I participate in that system? Uh, and then working on ways to, to, uh, to work around it. Um, but that burden is not my burden. It affects me, but it is not my burden. And that's one thing that I've resigned from doing. Uh, and I'm kind of contradicting myself because I'm doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I mean, the, you we're all going to have to do that and really do that seriously. Getting back to what Michael said initially, I mean, this is a hard conversation and it's multi-layered and will, and it's taken 500 years uh, of domination and control to build up to this point here. And it's going to take a long time before it disappears as well too. I would just add, um, to try to tie the, uh, the last two questions together a little bit as well, um, I would say that you have to really have the courage to have uncomfortable conversations. Um, the thesis project that, um, that I did uh, nine years ago now, um, yeah, that was sort of atypical for Cornell. Like, like who cares about issues in Detroit, uh, especially social issues, and how, like, how do you address that with design? Um, and so, yeah, it was pretty uncomfortable. I had some pretty awkward reviews. Uh, and I graduated, but you know, it was just like, um, it was just, it was, it was, a, it was a real struggle. Um, and I think, um, you know, you kind of continue, um, you know, doing that. You just kind of keep going, uh, going back to, um, you know, doing what you think is the right thing, even if it is uh, uncomfortable. Um, you know, that happened uh, when I was working for HOK in New York. Um, I actually started uh, HOK Impact, which is their like corporate social responsibility program, because there's no, you know, there's wasn't like an organized way of like mobilizing like all these dollars that were like kind of being spent on random like marketing things that, um, you know, you could sort of funnel towards like community projects, but they were like spending on other things. So I was like, well, let's be more strategic about that. Um, so, but it was sort of uncomfortable having that conversation, telling like you know these like really important people how to spend their money, but um, that worked out, so that was good. Um, and then here at the Kennedy School, um, after everything with, you know, in, with Ferguson and Staten Island happened, I actually have two, so I'm in the, uh, the mid-career program, so everyone has sort of done something before, and two of my classmates are NYPD uh, officers, and so that was a really uncomfortable conversation, but we had, we had a, you know, a real talk about like, what was happening. And I, you know, I think it's just, and actually one, one more story about um, my experience just last semester. Uh, I remember a white male classmate of mine um, said when, you know, when people were uh, looting in Ferguson, he was like, why are you guys looting? And I was like, you guys, like what? Like I'm, the, I'm like here at the Kennedy School, what are you talking about? Um, and I was like, I was like, we need to change the language on that. Like, mm -hmm. this is not a white problem. This is not a black problem. This is an American problem. And then we had, um, you know, sort of a, a group discussion um, about it. And then he changed his language. He's like, we really need to fix this. This is like, a, you know, this is like an American problem. And I was like, I just said that. <laughs> so, um, so it's just about continuing to have these really awkward conversations and just kind of sticking with it. Um, I, you know, I would say in terms of like what your personal role is. I think what's coming across on the panel is that our professional work is intensely personal. 
Um, I know for me, the thing that I'm, I'm trying to challenge myself with is how do you really become a meaningful ally um, to different causes? And, and for me, whether that means you know, showing up. So a, a little over a month ago um, in Skid Row, another you know, unarmed black male was, was shot by LAPD. Um, and it was important to show up. You know, I, I know like, I was probably the only designer out there holding a sign, and I think um, that's an important role. And I think as an ally, really thinking about what it means to show up with the resources and, and really trying to be strategic about how you can be most impactful. Um, you know, I think it's one thing to, to be compassionate or, you know, to read the article or to share something um, and, and disseminate information. Then I think there's something else about how do we authentically leverage so that we're really effectively supporting um, these other causes. Yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of what has been said. I think there's, we have an ability to create a safe space um, for these conversations to be held. And I think I've sort of taken that on as a mandate to try and figure out ways that I can do that in my, my work and my world and the places that I intersect. And that also as part of creating that safe space, as I said, being vulnerable and modeling like a way to have that conversation because I think that's part of what it takes to build a safe space. And then as sort of as Teresa said, like showing up in these places where these conversations are starting to happen. You know, last month I found myself at this forum that was about community development and health equity and there weren't very many designers in the room. And so to be able to say I'm here and I want to figure out how to help in this, this situation, or um, there was a meeting last week that was about um, the city of Oakland's looking at creating a department of equity or having somebody who's around that. And I am starting to see those things, and so I think it's about making sure you go and participate in those conversations. People are reacting to what has been happening, and they're trying to figure out how to help. So make sure that you're there as part of those conversations, adding both what you can bring from a professional standpoint, and even if you're a student, you have knowledge, bring that to the table, but also what you can bring from a personal standpoint, because that is also knowledge and that is also expertise. And I, I mean, it's going to be a slow road because it's taken many hundreds of years to build to where we are now. But I think it's investing and also taking pride in the small victories. Like, I think it's going to be a long time before we see something major that we're like, all right, we've changed it. But there are small victories happening every day, whether it's that person sort of saying that, though not quite realizing that it came from you. Um, but that's a, that's a victory, right? And so so build upon that, and I, I think just look for the low-hanging fruit, because it's many low-hanging fruit that create the big change. There's a remarkable energy and ethos in this room. I, I don't know that I've ever been in Piper with quite this vibration, but um, and I and I think a, a lot of it is um, a lot of it obviously is the audience, the commitment of the audience, and I really appreciate. Right. But this has been a most amazing panel, and say to Kimberly, Teresa, Liz, I thank you so much for doing this. It really it was really great. Um, I do want to say just one more thing. There are a lot of people uh, involved in making this work, but I personally want to thank Jamie, um, who made made this so easy. And so easy. Um, remember that this started because the African American Student Union came to the uh, dean, came to the faculty. They insisted on being heard. They insisted on being seen. They insisted on a response. And the dean made the response, and that remarkable first meeting in Piper, I think, is the reason it, it, it started this. I, I can guarantee you that this will continue to make a difference. It'll make a difference in the curriculum. We're already doing curriculum planning. We're already designing, we'll spend the summer designing a course on race and space that the GSD will teach. We've, in the meantime, we've cross-listed several courses with African American studies, with history, with, um, uh, there was one other department, I can't remember, but we've cross-listed courses. We will look at studios and how studios can be a venue, not, not, not just having a studio about race, but talking about these issues of equity um, uh, uh, across
across studios. Uh, I guarantee you that will happen. I guarantee you the hiring, you'll see differences this next year in, in, in hiring. Um, and and, and I, I think the important thing is to keep the conversation open. The, it was the conversation that, that, that morning in Piper that started this. And I think we have to keep the conversation open in the chow house. We have to keep it open in the trays. I promise we'll keep it open in faculty meetings. And um, it, 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 we just have to keep the momentum going. Kimberly. Speaking of which, um, I just wanted to uh, speaking of keeping the conversation going, I wanted to plug an event that Mark Norman, a Loeb Fellow, is moderating on Saturday over at the Kennedy School that talks about hope for housing. So again, a continuation wow. of what I was talking about, but um, Mark will be leading a panel of um, five um, national experts on housing and the history behind housing. So I think it'd be a really rich conversation. Um, you know, he's sort of bringing the design lens to it, but everyone else is sort of leading charges around the U.S. So I just wanted to plug that Thanks. Black Policy Conference um, also co-sponsored by the Joint Center for Housing Studies. So, And just one more thank you. It's a personal one. is Dana McKinney. She really, for me, made this happen.